Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Mike Levine. I'm the Executive Director of the Junkie and Student <laughs> Center, and I want to welcome you to the Learning at Home Forum. We are so delighted that you all have come from far corners of the United States and some of you internationally to be here with us in New York, and otherwise known as the Ice Bowl. <laughs> As, uh, as leaders in, in different sectors, from media production to research to educational practice to policy and philanthropy, you'll note that your table mates, and I want to tell you, those of you in the back of the next seat, these are fine. Come on up, come on down, as they say in the press. <laughs> um, you'll know that your table mates may very well have very different expertise than your own, and that's wholly intentional on our part. We'll be using our multi sector ness today as a real strength in responding to the new study. Um, we're especially grateful to Vicki wright who's authored, I think, a very timely, a very timely and provocative report that's inspired this convening. And um, of course, to our generous funders, the Bezos Family Foundation, Isaac Simons Foundation, um, the Life Center, and uh, AARP. Um, I want to also especially thank Dr. Charles Frank of McGraw Hill for providing this lovely space. Thank you. Um, and just so that I make sure that I do this because it's really so important to us as a small team, let me recognize the team in the center, led by Lori Takaucci, Michelle yeah. Miller, Captain G, Katrina Sterak Kaur, and Jason Yip, and Brianna Pressey, and Anna Lee, and um, uh, Sam Zeltek, everybody's really contributed to this. It really takes a big effort, you all know, to carry off a forum with high, um, with high standards. The study released today and the conversation we have planned will bring new attention, I think, to the enduring value that parents place on learning in a digital age, and hopefully it will lead us to identify priorities that deserve national action now. An important backdrop for this conversation is our increasingly robust understanding about child development and the positive life trajectories, which are launched through optimal conditions in the early years. Breakthroughs, many of you have been part of these in scientific research on children's brain and socio-emotional development, as well as policies that promote early intervention and family strengthening increasingly point to the first decade of life, especially the first five years of life, and laying a strong pathway for all that follows. So, Important as the national attention and large investment on in school reform is, the premise of our conversation today is that we may be missing some key ingredients and opportunities to build a stronger foundation. So let's take a close look at just how little time is spent by America's young children in formal learning environments. This slide from the Life Center is one of my favorites. It documents that less than 20% of all waking hours are spent in formal learning over a lifetime, and even less than that, obviously, in the preschool years. Of course, our national investments don't align to this chart. One kind of logical, duh, conclusion is encouraging positive interactions with caring adults and with high quality content must command greater attention before a child enters school. The research work that we're discussing today then begins with a focus on learning in the home. At the CUNY Center, we're documenting the evolving influences on family development in the digital age. By starting with parents and their children's changing routines around media consumption, we're aiming to modernize my mentor, Yuri Bronfenberger's pioneering research as documented in this chart. No, it doesn't come from my dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> so Yuri pointed out that there's a family ecological system and we're interested in tracking the different influences that shape a child's life course, including parent-child interactions, role of peers, finding ways to bridge formal and informal learning, and galvanizing really important needed changes in how leaders like all of you support the early and most formative years. Added to the real consensus in the scientific community about the importance of early interactions and the value of high-quality out-of-school experiences for older kids, many policymakers and journalists who may have noted recently are taking uh, on the primacy of parental engagement in driving educational choices. For example, many of you may have read Tom Friedman's New York Times column this last Sunday, citing our painful slump in international achievement. He cited it as a clarion call for much more vigorous involvement of parents in setting higher educational goals. Last week, the President and Congress 
approved a major expansion of Head Start and other early learning programs. And recently, the Department of Education proposed doubling national funding for family engagement activities. Uh, Education Secretary Arnie Duncan, in announcing new plans to support family engagement, said, parents will always be a child's first and most important teacher, but to really help our kids, we have to change expectations about how hard they should work and what kinds of experiences they have right from the start. The increased national dialogue on early learning and engaged parenting is, in my view, and I'm sure many of you, welcome news. It often falls short, however, in considering what I think is one of the most powerful decisions parents can and do make. How to develop a balanced approach to the rapidly increasing media choices that are now available anytime, anywhere to children at earlier and earlier ages. At the Kimmy Center, we're prioritizing three key issue clusters that we think deserve more attention and which I hope we will be discussing throughout the day. First, we need new public awareness, industry incentives, and commonly understood measures to improve media quality linked to educational outcomes and healthy development. Today, we will begin to drill into what we know about parental perceptions of media of educational value. Second, we need a much deeper and more precise understanding of the evolving nature of family interactions with media. That is, what are the best opportunities and situations for families to learn and play together or alone with media? Can we design better products and educational models to allow the family crucible to do more? And third, and perhaps most importantly, we need to better understand ethnocultural diversity in the new media environment and take actions to promote equity. Today, I hope we can explore what are the right incentives to promote new partnerships for equity and more culturally competent media products. To help propel action, of course, we need to know more. We know some. And we need to work across discipline as a rule, not an exception. Inspired by the need for new partnerships in the work of scholars in the fields of child development, communications, and the learning sciences, we have organized an exciting alliance that will be releasing studies like this one, educational resources and materials through the Families and Media Project, or FAM. The partners in the new project span a wide range of organizations and disciplinary perspectives. We're delighted to be able to connect leading scholars and media experts from across the country, as you see in the slide, and to be working with so many of the early learning and literacy organizations here today. We're so pleased to be working closely with ARP, Common Sense Media, National Center for Families Learning, New America, PBS, Fred Rogers, uh, the list goes on, CPP. Leaders from each of these institutions are here today. <clears throat> and finally, our related studies, um, the National Survey released today, a group of regional studies, and a forthcoming longitudinal impact study are intended to help inform policy, influence the design of media, media-based in in interventions, as I suggested, and perhaps most importantly, provide needed, timely resources for parents and educators to increase the amount of quality interaction around media. As the findings of the national study released today make clear, the influence on media, the influence of media on family life is here to stay. We announced the center in this building almost exactly six years ago. Anything here for that? Yes. It's nice to be back. It's been our intention, and I hope that we've lived up to some of that potential to serve as a field builder, an open source research and dissemination agent, and a collaboration hub. Working together, we firmly hope that educators, policymakers, and media designers will gain needed insights and deploy digital technologies in increasingly powerful ways. To get our forum rolling, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Victoria Wrightout, the author of Learning at Home, which each of you have at your places. Vicki's well known to most of you as a leading expert on children's health, media use, and policy. But even more central to her remarkable track record, in my view, has been her devotion to developing new forms of evidence in areas often neglected in the public discourse. Her work is driven by the highest standards of excellence, be it for national survey <coughs> studies, public communication work, or tireless advocacy for children and families. Vicki will share the new survey report and reflect on some possible implications. Her remarks will lead off a highly interactive forum, which will be led by Amy Jordan of the University of Pennsylvania's Edinburgh School of Communications, and Lisa Guernsey, who leads New America's Early Education Initiative. They and our discussion provocateurs have been a delight to work with, and I must thank them all in advance for the brilliant work they will be with us today. But now, Vicki, we're all eager to hear about how parents describe learning with media at home. 
please recognize Nifty right after.